Hello and welcome to Just Films and That with me, Josh Hallam. And me, Alice Oliver. This is the podcast where we talk about films that we think are underrated, underappreciated, or we just wanted to talk about them. We're also going to get stuck into some classic films that one of us maybe hasn't seen and maybe throw in some great guests along the way. Uh, so we start, as we do every week, uh, with a random question. Alice, simple one this week, bath or shower? Oh, bath or shower. I mean, how much time have I got? That's the ultimate question, isn't it? If I've got time, always a bath. I do love having a bath. makes me nice and warm. I get really cold, fingers and toes. So a nice bath at the end of a hot day, maybe a glass of wine, put a podcast on, usually this one, because I love to hear myself talk. <laughs> no, joke. Um, but shower also fine. Like I don't dislike a shower. I feel like maybe you do feel a bit more clean when you come out of the shower as well, because you're not, you know, just kind of soaking in your own water. Um, but I, the really disappointing thing, and I've only really been thinking about how disappointing this is recently, is I can't use bubble bath because like my skin's really sensitive and I just get loads of issues if I ever use bubble bath. But my husband always has a bubble bath and I'm so jealous. And it just, I feel like the water is just like silkier and softer if you've got bubble bath in it and it smells lovely as well. So I get a bit jealous about that. But no, in general, a nice bath, even though it is just me in the water. What about you? <laughs> um, I love it when people say that. I love it when people say that about baths and they say, you know, you, you're basically just in your own filth, aren't you? And I always think, how dirty are you? Like, if you're getting it, like, I'm not talking about doing a long day down the mines than getting in the bath and sitting in all cold, soaked water. No. So I just, I never get that because I always think, well, when you get in the bath, if I, if I exercise, I'll always have a shower because you're sweaty. However, I do prefer a bath. Yeah. But like, like your husband, um, I like a bubble bath. I do. Mm. I like candles. I like a glass of wine, a bath bomb, if there's one going. I also have sensitive skin, so I buy, like, bath bombs that are for sensitive skin and stuff like that. They're, they're quite good. Yeah, and then I usually put something on my laptop to watch and then put that on the toilet like it's a TV. So I think I think most people say showers are more practical. And like, like you say, if, you, if you're in a hurry or whatever. I have a shower first thing in the morning to wake myself up. I'll quite often just have a cold shower just to try and focus myself and because and I'm always really drowsy first thing in the morning. But yeah, You absolutely. do really, you have, you have a cold shower, really. You do yeah, that yeah. to yourself. Only for, um, <gasps> so you get in when it's sort of average, you know, lukewarm temperature and then just sort of do any washing that you feel you need to do. And then at the end, just turn it right down as quickly as you can and just last as long as you can. So like, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds or something like that. Okay, interesting. Interesting. I might try that. It's Josh, really good because for Because I, I am quite, yeah. It's really good for focus. I don't know if it's some sort of caveman thing that's like your body going, I'm going to die. And then you're ready for the day. But, you know, anyway, bath for relaxation, shower for practicality. So we'll move on to talking about this week's film, uh, which is uh, chosen by myself, uh, and it was Ed Wood, which is uh, from 1994, I believe. So spoilers if you've not seen it. Um, it's directed by Tim Burton, stars Johnny Depp, amongst other people. So Johnny Depp plays a director in the 50s called Ed Wood. He's often affectionately considered to be one of the worst directors of all time by a lot of people. And the film sort of follows Wood as he tries to carve out a career as a film director in a in a sort of very cutthroat judgmental industry and despite facing all these personal and professional obstacles he 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 remained optimistic despite the fact he's sort of a little bit restricted by his own ability shall we say so alice i'm interested to know have you watched this one before no i hadn't seen this one before i had heard of it and i think i did know uh, that it was johnny depp and tim burton together um and that is that is a duo that i'm a big fan of so i was very excited to watch this one uh, but after having watched it i'm interested to know why you picked with this one was this an underrated or an underseen for you yeah so um it's it's probably i'd have to say it's it's underseen probably because i know it's pretty highly rated in terms of the films that 
Tim Burton and Johnny Depp have done together. Like I think this this one's up there on the most um, critically well received. It's also one of the sort of least mad, you know, least cartoonish, if you like, because it is a, a biopic. So I picked it because I thought it was underseen. We also hadn't done a Tim Burton film yet, and I thought well, it's probably high time we, we did do a Tim Burton film. We also hadn't done a Johnny Depp film, and I do think this is a film where he is quite good. Again, it's one of his... Le- it, it's the less cartoony by the standards of Johnny Depp himself has set, and yet the performance itself is still quite cartoony. So, probably, yeah, so I picked it because it's underseen. I also wrote down that you know, I, I thought I'd pick it because we hadn't done a biopic yet. Uh, and we did <laughs> we did Legend like a few weeks ago, so ignore that. <laughs> underseen, so I picked it because I think it's underseen. Okay, okay, well, and I hadn't seen it, so uh, there's there's one point for that. Um, how did you feel coming away from it? Was this like the first time you'd seen it in a while? Is this one that you kind of watch, you know, semi-regularly? Yeah, it's probably one that I haven't seen for a couple of years. I have seen it on a number of a number of occasions, and I mean, I I I really love the film. That's why I've picked it. So, and and it still held up for me. I I thought it was still brilliant. I think there's a few things I want to talk about. Um, the the main two things I love about this film are a, a sort of that one of them is the visual style, and one of them is the performances. But I want to come to you first. What did you think of it? So I did. I did really enjoy it, and. I, you know what? I just got so excited when I see Bill Murray and Johnny Depp on screen together. I was just like, fabulous. I feel like we're in for a heck of a ride here. Um, interesting that, yeah, what you say there about the visual style, I thought it looked fantastic. There was such a wonderful array of um, camera techniques. There were so many close-ups and then so many medium close-ups. And then beyond that, just so many other kinds of things as well. Uh, fantastic use of shadow, I thought, uh, a lot of times. Uh, there was um, a couple of scenes, I think, actually, where... Uh, Johnny Depp's character, so Ed Wood, was at, uh, is it Lago Seas, the the sort of the guy who played Dracula? That yeah, Be- Bella Lugosi, yeah. Bella, Bella, Lugosi, Bella Lugosi, Lugosi. He's famous it. for playing like what you think of as the first really famous iteration of Dracula with the slick back hair and the big black cape and the white shirt, yeah. Yeah, certainly. So he went around his house a couple of times, I think, and just sort of every time he went around there, there was such a wonderful use of shadow and a lot of the costume choices and the set design in those instances was great. And it really it really did remind me of uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula and a lot of the things that you see in that. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. Um, the music was brilliant. I found myself sofa dancing, like loads to it. Like I would just be sit sat there and I'd be doing this. You you can't see me because this is a podcast, but I'm jiggling my butt and moving my shoulders around. I just couldn't <laughs> stop dancing to it. And then also, um, so uh, I keep going to say Black Swan. It's not Black Swan. The Swan Lake score uh, mm. came up a lot of times. And I'm wondering if if you know much about why that was used so prominently. I had some ideas about it being, you know, like the duality of man and sort of Edward's character. He has, you know, this version of himself that he shows to the outside world and then a version of himself that he shows, you know, that's his personal self. And I know that sort of Tim Burton, you know, he's quite a complex character. So I wondered if that had, had much to do with it. I, d- I don't know. Had you noticed that about the Swan Lake score? It's an interesting point you make that. I'm not too sure why they why they use that music, whether it's because it's used in the actual um, films with Bella Lugosi and themselves, or like you say, if it's a comment on things like duality, or if it's just because they like it. I also love the music as well, like because it, it comes into the style of the film. So not only the visual style, but the audio style as well. So it's very much made in in the way Tim Burton makes his films in that gothic sort of element. But what they do, what I really love, is they take Ed Wood's film and they make a biopic about Ed Wood in the style of Ed Wood. So, like, there's there's lots of sort of sets that are obviously models and things are meant to look really sort of quite kitsch is the word that comes to mind. So kitsch, you know, it's ironically bad, it's excessively garish, it, it looks crap on purpose because it's paying homage to the fact that these films were made with you know crap costumes and on and on tiny tiny budgets and with rubbish props and bad sets and 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 you can see the strings on the models and all that and that and that's something i really like or like there's a scene when it looks like ed is driving bella lugosi home i think and it's quite clear that they purposely use a projection screen because that's what they would have done in an ed wood film 
But the music is very much part of that visual style and they use that sort of 50s style, like like what you'd imagine with Invasion of the Body Snatchers or Invading Aliens, you know. I don't really know what you'd call it, but it sounds like a, like a woo, you know, that that's very bad impression, but you know what I mean. And, and that lends itself to the sort of campy kitsch value of the film, which in turn is paying homage to the films that they themselves are interpreting interesting that it's obviously like set in the 50s but it is made as if it was made in the 50s as well like there's so many wipes i love that i just it just make, it makes me laugh so much and like you say about using the projection and stuff it was just like it, it's a really interesting style choice i thought and it made it made the kind of black and white element of it feel like really real like it wasn't just a modern film where they got oh yeah let's make this black and white to make it really dark and moody it's like oh no it actually had like a, a purpose in it yeah and and you almost stop no because because it does such a good job of immersing you in the world of the film you stop noticing the black and white which obviously most films more than nine out of ten films that you watch these days are not in black and white. So this sticks out because it's made in the 90s and it's in black and white. But once you get immersed into the world, it does a really good job of making you forget that. And that's partly down to the fact that you, that what we said in the way it's paying homage. In terms of it being a Tim Burton film, his style, I mean, his fingerprints are on it all the way through. But really, the only real bit that you'd be like, no, that's Tim Burton is the opening where... Criswell comes out of a coffin sort of as if he's the narrator and then goes back in again. But other than that, it's very much made. And even that itself is like Edward's films because if you've ever watched any of them, there's bits of, and bobs on YouTube and stuff. Um, they are like that. They, you know, There's a lot of really quickly made, cheaply made films where like some random narration over the top explains what's going on because they were making these films so quickly and so cheaply, which was very much um, a trope of the time. But even more so in this, because it was such a quick and easy way to to get messages from the film across when they were shooting like 30 scenes in a day or whatever. I loved that opening scene, especially because what follows it is is completely detached from that. So I really so I really didn't know kind of what to expect going in. So I didn't so Edward is was a real man. Is that is that what you're saying to me? He was a real man and he was a real director. Yeah, everyone in it's real. Wow, see, I had, so I had absolutely no idea. Wow, how ignorant do I feel? I've got a degree in film. How dare I? Um, but it's so brilliant because it is that. So, he, yeah, he's, you, so you're going like these panning and crabbing shots kind of through the graveyard with all the sort of, is, is it the all the cast names on the gravestones, which I thought was really great. And then you come to, is it, sorry, who, who, was, who was the guy in the coffin again? I did write his name. Criswell. Again. He's like a he's, he's a he's a psychic at the t again, he's a real guy. He was just he was a psychic at the time who was known for making garishly crap um predictions like, you know, we'll be living on Mars in five years or whatever it is. So when obviously he pops out that coffin, he's wearing that great costume, the whole effect, the whole scene is brilliant. And then it just cuts to kind of like normal life and you know everything's back to kind of normal i'm using you know air quotes normal kind of just ordinary i suppose so because i thought well, as that as this film was opening and as that scene was playing out that it was going to be like more like that that it was going to be a film about vampires because i didn't i was just so ignorant i suppose to actually what the film was about um but he was great i loved him as a character so so many of the characters i just thought were were brilliant like really just a really eclectic mix of people, I thought. And I feel like all the actors did a, a really great job. I thought performance-wise, it was great. And um, just quickly harking back, uh, before I forget um, about the fact that it was in black and white, one of the funniest moments in the film, I thought, was where um, one of the one of the female cast members asks, asks some guy, like, oh, which dress is better, the red one or the green one? And he goes, I have no idea. I'm colorblind. And it's like, I just thought that was really funny because obviously we're watching a black and white film. So it's like all the audience are colorblind as well with you. And, and it literally makes no difference whether you're wearing the red or the green dress. I thought that was really funny. Yeah, it's a good little wall, fourth wall breaking joke, isn't it? Because there he says, I like the darker gray one, which is what you see as the darker gray one, whether that's the red or the green one. So it's like that little wink and a nod to the audience. Like, you know, it's a black and white film. And and you're right, you know, it, he, he is... It is a true story, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's a, you know, it's it's not a, a biopic of, you know, someone that's incredibly well known. It's not, it's not Gandhi or, you know, something about a member of the royal family or another huge, huge star. 
um, like, I don't know, for example, Judy Garland or someone like that, like we did that like when we were talking about um, her the other week. So it, I'm not sure, even sure. I think it's based on a few books, and I think he himself, Edward, wrote memoirs. But I think a lot of it is is fairly true. But I think they take, from what I've read, a very optimistic outlook on his life, which will which will come on to shortly. But every character in it, as far as I know, all the main players are are real people. So Bella Lugosi was real. He did he did pass away during the production of one of his films. But that's what I like about it is that is the performances are half based in it's sort of half naturalistic and half stylized isn't it so i don't know if there's much footage of what ed wood was actually like or if he actually was like what johnny depp is portraying i know there were people involved in the film who had criticisms and praise for the for the depictions of various characters but the performances for me um were one of the sort of standouts of the film like what what did you think of johnny depp's performance Oh yeah, brilliant. And and always great to see him so young. Like I feel I felt the same way when I see him in Edward Scissorhands and it kind of reminded me of that bit of like uh, fear and loathing as well, like just young Depp. Like he's he he did do a really great job and I'm just I I just can't believe it was it it was actually based on a real guy. Like I'm, I I had no idea. Like I just cuz when when we do this, like I like to go into it blind. I don't want to like research anything about the films before we go in. And I wonder if that would have made me watch it in a different light. Um, but no, yeah, Johnny Depp was great, and I feel like we got really good performances out of all the cast. At no point did I think, um, you know, that oh that person's a bad actor or that person's unconvincing at all. And um, so Juliet Landau, Juliet Landau, do you know who she is? So she played Loretta King. She is Drusilla in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Did yes. you watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer? No, I, I did not. But I do know that she is Martin Landau's daughter and Martin Landau plays Bella Lugosi. Right. Okay. So it was the father and daughter. Mm. Uh, interesting. So I loved, I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Love Angel. Love it all. Uh, and I hadn't seen her in anything but Buffy. So when she came on screen, I was just like, oh my God, that's Drusilla from Buffy. So that was great. And she gave a great performance as well. Um, yeah, the, the sounds as well. I don't know if you, if you picked up much on the sounds, but just like the Foley artist was obviously doing a lot of work. There was one scene where they were in sort of the gallery of a, of a cinema or something. And there was a film reel like churning and churning and churning. And it was just so loud. I think, uh, Johnny Depp, he was trying to have a conversation with another character and you could barely hear what they were saying over the sound of this film reel. And I thought that was great. And just like really, kind of emotive aesthetics and use of sound, I think. And I felt like it really kind of brought the story to life. There was one moment where they're in the cinema and you get the light, obviously, that's coming out of the gallery and there's so much dust, like just completely filling the cinema. And it, you just really feel that kind of 1950s feel, I guess. No, you're right. And that's a big part of how why the film succeeds so much in drawing you into it because you do really feel that you're in this 50s tinsel town and the black and white almost helps with that like you say because it's only black and white you can see the dust really well and you can like you say the soundscape is really interesting not only is the music really interesting but you know you can hear the roar of every of every car engine and you can and you can hear the like you say the, the ticking of the film or like all the when he has the props like the props because it's a film about filmmaking the props has a lot to do because I always think it must be a bit of a nightmare to make a film about a film because you must have your crew behind a camera crew and then behind a set. So it's like a set behind a fake set. So it must be quite a strange experience to make a film about a film. But you do have these great scenes where they, they've got different props. Like there's one where they've got this giant octopus and it's supposed to be a monster that's living in the water and it's supposed to be smothering to death and wrestling with Bella Lugosi's character, but they forget to put the motor in it or, it, or the motor in it is broken. So he, he has to just ride around with it on him. So it looks like, um, it looks like the, 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 the octopus monster type thing is attacking him. But the, the films that he makes, so Plan 9 from Outer Space and, and uh, Bride of the Atom and Glenn, and Glenn or Glenda, it depicts a lot of the... He made a lot more films, I think, than the film depicts, but they, they, are, they have got this huge cult following. I know people like John Waters are, are big fans of it because of the kitsch kind of value that they bring. And I know people go in a little bit like you get with The Room, like people go and watch them and they interact with the film and, and they, you know, they laugh at the right moments and they join in at the right moments. And it's, I think 
it's good that the film is made so optimistically. It's made, I think Tim Burton said he made the film that he thought Ed Wood would make about himself or that he, he made the film through Ed Wood's eyes. And I do, there are some darker sides of, of Ed Wood's personality, which we'll, which we'll come on to uh, later. But but I do really like that it approaches that with that optimism. And it's got a great, it's not a, it's not a film that is criticizing him. It's not a film that is going, you know, look at this rubbish director. It portrays him, and it's a lot of that's down to Johnny Depp's performance. It, it portrays him as a man that's sort of really driven and really passionate about what he's doing, but he's but he's constantly trying to keep everything together and he's pulling in every favor he can and he's relying on all these friends who are these very larger than life type characters, especially when you consider the the time that it's set. And a lot of that is down to, like you say, the sound and the visuals. But the other side of it is, like we've already said, with with, with the performances. So I love Johnny Depp's performance. I know he 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 plays plays it as a as a man who is he's always trying to keep it together. But every time something goes wrong, he tries to see the positive. So it even starts with him putting a play on, which I think is a supposedly about his own experiences in the war, and it gets absolutely slated by the critics, but he finds like one little nugget of nice, it's, you know, it'll be something right down to, you know, the costumes were all right or something. And he always stays optimistic. And, and that goes through the whole film. You know, every time a film flops, it's, well, the next one will be better. So I find that quite uplifting. I find that sort of optimism quite uplifting about the film. Um, I also loved, I suppose, the, the yin to the yang of Edward's character is is Bella Lugosi. So Martin Landau, I believe, won his Oscar, one of his Oscars for this film. And I'd never really appreciated his performance. I'd always knew he was good in it, but I've been back and looked at like older photos of Bella Lugosi, and he, he looks so much like him in the way he is he carries himself and he and the way he he walks and how slowly he moves. I mean, you know, he had quite a tragic end you know, to his life as is depicted in the film. But I think he's, and he gives a brilliant performance because like I said, Johnny Depp is, well, Edward, should I say, is is this massively optimistic character. And yet, Bela Lugosi is this sort of worn out, you know, he burnt out elderly morphine addict that is Bela Lugosi, this, this sort of fallen star, if you will, just trying to claw back any credibility. The fact that every other character in the film, every time he is mentioned when he's not in a scene, they all think he's dead. You know, and, and I, I love that. I love his depiction and how he's so dour and sort of burnt out by it all. And Edward is so young and so driven i think that's quite an interesting interesting dynamic i mean there isn't a bad performance in it like you say bill murray is in it he's very very good um sarah jessica parker's in it she's very good as the sort of exasperated wife who is trying to support her partner well, she's not his wife i think she's his girlfriend she's she's trying to support her partner but she's just not quite sure how to do it and can't understand why it's almost like she she loves him and she wants him to succeed but she just doesn't share in his own optimism about his ability what do you think about the script so it it was fine. So it, I wasn't like completely gripped all the way through. I didn't find it a particularly exciting film, and I didn't find it like incredibly gripping. But I thought I thought the script was was absolutely fine, and it wasn't, it you know it it wasn't cheesy and it wasn't unbelievable. And those are the kind of things that I'm looking for with scripts. And it it wasn't lazy either. And those are the things that I find really bother me with a script. If I just think no, that's not a real conversation. No one would ever speak like that. Or if it just kind of doesn't fit well, but I thought I thought it did absolutely fine. But I I assume that because you've asked, you have something to say about the script. Well, yeah, no, I really like the script because so so I I like that it it's to the same scriptwriters who wrote Man on the Moon, which is the Andy Kaufman biopic. If you've not seen that, it's, it's well worth a look. And I really like the way they write because they write with a sympathetic eye and they write with a real love for the for the leading characters and. Um, I really enjoy that. I always wonder with scripts and, and you know, when a film like this is so stylized, I always wonder, does the script incorporate that? It does the script say, you know, the film opens like a Tim Burton film or do they write the script and then the director goes, well, can we change this, this and this? I'm always quite, you know, interested to know, does Tim Burton come on and does he Tim Burtonify the film or have they written it with Tim Burton in mind to direct? I'm not too sure, but no, I enjoy it because it's, it's very darkly comic at times. Um, it's the most natural. The dialogue's probably the most naturalistic part 
about the film. And like I said, it's made with a real love for all the characters. We should probably touch as well on, on the fact that the script does a really good job of discussing... Um, it's very much has a comment to make on identity. So if you haven't seen the film, Edward himself likes to um, he likes to cross dress. Um, he likes to wear ladies' clothes. I believe what he said was, and I've got a note here that his wife, Kathy, who is portrayed by Patricia Arquette in the film, later later came out and she basically said that he 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 wasn't in any way trans and he was heterosexual but that his mother would dress him in women's clothing because because she wanted a, a girl and so that later on he just drew this sort of neo-maternal comfort from it so i thought that was quite interesting and the film doesn't it doesn't it's not about that he comes out at the time which must have been incredibly brave and just tells people that he wants to make a film about someone who cross-dresses because he himself cross-dresses you know, I, I really enjoy that. It doesn't labor the point too much. It doesn't make it a film about that. This is not what the film is about. It's about him. And that's just one of the things about him as a person, which made him an interesting subject, I suppose. Yeah, certainly. Like, it's not his whole character. It's just another aspect of him, like the color of his hair or like his height. It's just like, oh, I just happen to enjoy wearing women's clothes. But he, he obviously does feel a bit pained by it and like he does want to share it a bit. So he, he shares it with his girlfriend, Sarah Jessica Parker's character. And she, she, I can't quite recall, does she, I feel like she doesn't take it very well to begin with. But then she's, does she kind of come to terms with it or do they break off the relationship because she just can't deal with it? No, I don't, I don't she, yeah, I think it's like you say, she doesn't take it very well, but they don't break up because of it. I think they break up because he gives uh, Juliet Landau's character, he gives her a part that was meant for Sarah Jessica Parker. So he can allegedly get some money for the film to be made. As it turns out, she doesn't have any money. So it's things like that, but it doesn't, it does not paint the film. To, it doesn't paint her in the way that it's like, that's why she splits up with him. It's just that it's part, and I like that as the film progresses, it starts and he's, he, he very much, he does a, a lot of sort of telling people, this is why the reason he should be able to do this particular film is because he, he does this. And then as it goes on and on, it just, he, it just normalizes the fact that he's wearing ladies clothes as he directs, um, up until the point where he it causes issues with one of the film's backers because they're a Baptist church. I like what the film has to say about acceptance, you know, all his friends just well, that's just that's just Eddie, that's just our friend. And I like that, especially because it's set in a time that was, you know, I don't think it's unfair to say, a lot less tolerant of this kind of thing. So we'll move on to talking about things that we perhaps didn't like about the film. Um, is, is there anything for you, Alice? Is there anything you didn't like? Just thinking about what I said previously, just about the script just not being... It, it just didn't have a wow factor for me, like like the whole film. Like, I didn't come away loving it. I didn't sort of come away thinking, oh, I'm so glad I saw that film. Um, I didn't dislike it at all. But do you know what I mean when it just kind of doesn't, just doesn't kind of whack you like like other films do? Um, like, it, obviously, it was quite funny, but it wasn't hysterically funny. Um, you know, it was quite dramatic, but not totally dramatic. And it was quite sad, but then not devastatingly sad either. It was just, well, I suppose, very real because... That is what life is, isn't it? It's not always these heightened emotions all the time. And I do wonder if perhaps I was more aware of Edward as a character and aware that it was based on an actual man who lived and all these characters who lived. Maybe I would have watched it with different eyes. So no, yeah, interesting. Was there anything for you? Or was there anything that you noticed watching it this time around that perhaps you didn't previously? Um, Nothing that I massively disliked. I think that... there. Johnny, I like Johnny Depp's performance, but there are times when he's a little one note. Like he has that sort of fixed grin on his face all the way through, and that sort of way of speaking that's very upbeat, as if like he's like I've said, he's constantly trying to see the the optimistic side of things, and and anything might make him snap. And there's only really one moment I could think of, or the few moments where he is anything but that. There's the moment where he finds out. Bella Lugosi has died and there's the moment where he loses his temper with the Baptist uh, church because they're trying to interfere in his film but a lot of the time he's he's very one note now I don't know what Ed Wood was like as a person so perhaps that is what he was like but I did think there were times when I suppose the only way I can put it is that his performance is a little bit annoying um, or a little bit hammy maybe but that's not 
I also like that about it. I like that optimism. So I guess that's just the other side of the coin. The other thing I would have liked to have seen more of is having read a little bit more around Ed Wood as a character. So there was a little bit more of a darker side to him. He was quite a bad alcoholic. And I believe that is what ultimately took, um, sort of led to, led to his led to his death. And I believe that is more to do. I think the, I think the character played by Sarah Jessica Parker went on to be a successful songwriter and wrote songs for Elvis and people like that. And I believe she was still alive when the film came out. And I think she said, "Well, actually, we split up because of his alcoholism, not because of um, you know how it's depicted in the film." So. As much as I really appreciate that the film is sympathetic to him and is trying to and is trying to make it through his eyes, I think a biopic has to be a bit more warts and all about its subject. It has to be a bit more, you know, here's the good, here's the bad, and here's just them. But nothing that I didn't like. I still enjoy the film. I would, you know, I'd watch it again. So no, nothing that I didn't like. And it's certainly a well-made film and it's it's visually, like we've already said, but it is visually very pleasing. And the cinematography and the sound, like there's just a lot of work that's gone in there. And and that that is always a great pleasure when you when you see that for sure. So we'll come on to talking about the critical reception then. Now I've picked this because it's it's underseen. I don't think it is underrated because I know that it is quite well thought of and I know it won a couple of awards and stuff. Um, so to give you an idea, um, well, well, how, how do you think it did? How do you think it did? Well, I, at first I thought maybe not so great, but now you've said that you feel like it's done well and it's won awards. So if I was going to rate it, I would probably, like, I'd probably sit on the seven mark and probably wouldn't go much higher than that, like probably dead on seven. Mm. But maybe, it probably got, I think, maybe a high seven. So I'd, I'd say maybe like a 7.8. Yeah, so you're not far off. So on Rotten Tomatoes, um, the audience give it 88% at time of recording Ooh. and the critics give it 92%. But Wow! But... On IMDb, it does actually get 7.8 out of 10, so you're spot on there. Oh, yeah, so, oh brilliant. So, oh, wow, those are big scores on the Rotten Tomatoes, aren't so they? So would you say that's overrated for you in terms of, in terms of its reception? I, th- I, I mean, a, nine, a 92, uh, yeah, yeah, certainly. I wouldn't have said it was 92% good, um, but, I mean, maybe maybe because it's critics isn't it like maybe this is the kind of thing that the critics like and if i suppose if you are familiar with ed wood which i imagine film critics are likely to be um maybe they maybe they just saw something in it that that i didn't quite but that's that, yeah that's a remarkable score i mean great like you know it's tim Byrne and johnny depp i'm really happy for them <laughs> Yeah, if only they'd work together more after this you know i mean yeah. you know more. <laughs> <laughs> no i know what you mean i mean i I really like the film, but I'm not sure I put 92% for it. I think, I think for me, the rating is somewhere in between those two scores, somewhere in between what you've said with the seven and somewhere between that 88%, maybe like an eight, eight and a half. I do really enjoy it. Um, but I picked it because it's underseen. So is it, is it, I mean, I, I think that I probably should have said this earlier, really. I think that when it came out, it's really critically well received, but I don't think it did very well commercially. I think it, don't, I'm not even sure it made its money back. So I, I I sort of took that and extrapolated and I thought, well, I think it's probably quite underseen because I know a lot of people, you do get a lot of people who really, really like Tim Burton, but what they usually say is things like Batman and Nightmare Before Christmas, which I know he, he didn't direct, but he, he was involved in and his name is very much plastered all over it. Or uh, Alice in Wonderland and Coraline and Frank and Weenie and all that other thing, all that other stuff. But I actually think Tim Burton himself is a good director, even when he's not putting his own massive style on things in terms of, you know, what you think of as his, as his, as his gothic style. So I really like that for this. I think it's as much as it is quite cartoony. I think it is um, more toned down. It's, it's a bit like, have you seen Big Fish, which is another Tim Burton film? I haven't, but this made me think that I should yeah, watch that's... Big Fish because I, you and McGregor's in yeah, that. Yeah, you right? and McGregor and uh, Albert Finney and um, uh, I can't remember who else, but uh, yeah. So, but it's a yeah, but that's really good, and that is it is quite magical and quite sort of with loads of big characters in it and stuff. But it's not 
as gothic, so it is a little bit different. So, and it is again the the, the heart of the film is at the store. It is the story, not necessarily the style. So, that's another reason why I picked this. But I do think it's underseen. So, would you agree? Is it underseen? Are we in an alliance on this one? I do think it's underseen. A because I hadn't seen it, but B it isn't a film that comes up very often. It's not a film like I've never seen clips used from it. You don't hear it quoted. It's just not one that people do really talk about. And I think you're right. And a, a lot of the time now, Tim Burton is is in the same breath as his more as the more animated ones, as as the ones that are you know the claymation or whatever it was that he was doing. Um, and this, yeah, I feel like. This is kind of like an almost like a standalone Tim Burton because of the black and white and because it isn't like it isn't supernatural in any way. It's it's just about people who are making films about supernatural things, which I think is really interesting. And if and if you say to people, name me three Tim Burton films, maybe even five, they probably wouldn't say this. And it's quite interesting that he made this in 1994. Uh, and if you look at his track record up, up then, you, you've got Batman Returns, Batman. A Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands all in us that sort of five year period so perhaps he got to this stage in his career and just thought oh I just want to make something with minimal effects and a very character driven story and I think that's what he do that's what he did but you know it's not going to make as much money as Batman or Beetlejuice is it uh, so there we go another one for the underseen pile Yes, I think we can agree that Edward is underseen. Uh, so if you're listening to this episode on iTunes, do feel free to go and give us a five-star review. Uh, it does us a massive favour and it means more people will get to listen to us. It means we can keep making the podcast or, you know, tell a friend. Go old school. Word of mouth, eh? Yeah, if, if you've got any friends unlike us who <laughs> just sit in rooms in a lockdown talking about films from 1994. Um, <laughs> as Alice said, anything you do uh, would be greatly uh, um, appreciated. Uh, that being said, if you would like to get in touch with the podcast, we've asked for some listener suggestions, which we're going to be doing hopefully in coming weeks. Um, if you would like to get in touch and give us a suggestion, it's films on that pod at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at films underscore that or Facebook and Instagram at films and that pod. Um, Alice, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you, Josh. Always lovely to sit and gab with you. And it's cheerio from me. Goodbye. Bye.